Uh, Tara, please. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Kalala, and thank you, everyone. So this panel is focused on congressional advocacy, uh, and I'm very pleased that we have two experts uh, on the panel today. Um, Tanya Kinlo is the Vice President of Community Engagement, Advocacy, and Government Affairs at Children's National, and has over 25 years of experience managing government relations. And Susan Sweat is a senior VP at Cornerstone Government Affairs uh, and worked as a senior staffer on Capitol Hill for uh, 10 years. So uh, they have, together they bring quite a bit of um, uh, history and experience to bear. So to, today we're gonna focus on I thought it was uh, fascinating to hear uh, Dr. Wessel kind of at the beginning of this meeting put together all the challenges that we face. He did it in a very concise way and he talked about uh, the challenges that all of us in this room are extremely familiar with. The problem is we all know what the challenges are but the people outside of this room don't. So we're talking to each other, and we somehow have to expand the conversation. And um, Melinda made a great point about uh, the need to break through walls, and that's what we've got to do with pediatric device uh, issues. So we've got to expand the conversation to a broader uh, uh, audience. Uh, and in particular, the people who make and affect policy. Um, so with that, I wanted to start with Tanya and ask you as a, in your role at Children's National, um, can you share with us the, the types of advocacy issues that you are choosing to work on, how you do that, how you identify the issues, uh, and share some of the thought processes that you undergo at Children's with this, this audience in terms of advocacy. Sure, so um, you know, at Children's National, advocacy is one of our primary focus. It's, it's a core component of our mission. Um, we believe that our location in the District of Columbia gives us a unique opportunity to be the public voice for pediatrics and pediatric devices and all things um, children's health care. Uh, as a result, we really work hard to make sure that we are actively engaged with members of Congress, but we are also involved in advocacy at the state levels. In the District of Columbia, we're proximate to Maryland and Virginia, and so we're engaged there as well, and obviously with the District of Columbia Council, which makes a lot of policy that impacts the work that we do. Um, we do that in a variety of ways at Children's National. Most important and significant to this audience is in working with our subject matter experts to help us to understand um, from the government affairs and advocacy side, what are those issues that you think we need to take to the Hill? What are those things that you think we believe policymakers need to understand about your work and how decisions that they make either impact or could make your work even easier? Um, and, and I think you've heard more than once the challenge that we face because while we're talking healthcare policy and there is robust conversations on Capitol Hill and in the state legislatures all the time around healthcare, bringing the presence and voice of pediatrics is something that if we're not doing it, it won't get done. And so just standing and being present is something that we think is so critically important. Right. Right. Susan, um, for people in this audience who may not be uh, actively engaged in advocacy, uh, particularly in, in DC, um, what are those key committees that, that impact 
policy around pediatric devices on Capitol Hill from your, your perch having worked up there for 10 years? So it would be really great if I could sit up here and tell you that there's one committee and there's 15 members and those are our guys and girls and those are the ones we're going after, but that's not what I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you there's six different committees that we're interested in um, because they touch pediatric devices in some way, whether that's through um, providing funding uh, to the FDA for their activities, whether that's through telling the FDA how to do their activities, it's a whole other committee. And then um, our tax committee um, also works on, on um, incentivizing our devices and looking and working on reimbursement for those devices. So we have three committees in the House and three committees in the Senate and you're talking about hundreds of members of Congress at that point. Um, so it makes our field pretty broad that we're going after. So if you were to um, advise someone in this room who said, you know, I do want to get involved, I want to change the landscape for PEDS, what would you tell them, what would be their first step to, to you know, be able to impact these committees. Great, so your first step should probably be touching base with your um, the company that you work for. If it's a large company, they likely have a government relations presence in Washington, D.C., um, or the association you're a member of, um, because they too have a, um, a presence in D.C. We have a lot of, I'm putting back on my staffer hat, having worked on the Hill for many years and been the top policy advisor for a senator, um, a lot of constituents um, call and write and email about a whole lot of different issues that they're passionate about. But very few of those are actionable if, um, if they're not quite cloaked in the language that I as a staffer understand about how I can be helpful, right? So calling, um, and, and this is what we do all the time, advising our clients on how to frame their message and who to bring their message to, right? Calling your member of Congress that sits on the agri agriculture committee and asking them to lead the charge and getting a new tax break for pediatric devices is likely not going to work. Um, that, um, that committee member has other things under their jurisdiction, and even if they did introduce that legislation, the, um, the committee who does the tax work is not going to take it as seriously as if it had been one of their own. So your first stop should always be looking around um, for who is already representing your point of view and starting there. Yeah, I would like to add, and I appreciate you, Susan, for saying go to your government affairs professionals first. One of the things that makes it a little bit difficult for people in my role is if someone from my team is out advocating on an issue or um, lobbying to make something happen, on Capitol Hill or anywhere, um, and I don't know about it, and I'm maybe going and I'm asking for something that's a little bit, maybe slightly different than what you're looking at. And so the reason that you have government affairs teams within your organizations or even with your professional association, as Susan mentioned, it's to help you navigate, which is what is sometimes a very complicated environment, but a place where if, in fact, you go in with the right strategy strategy and the right messaging, you can actually accomplish a lot. So, so let me ask both of you, um, because you're, you are both going up to Capitol Hill on these issues, you're talking to members, um, do you find that they uh, understand pediatric device issues uh, generally? Uh, some of them are very good, some are not. I mean, how do you find that um, educational level when you go up to Capitol Hill, how, you know, and what, what are your strategies for dealing with that? So uh, members of Congress don't know anything about pediatric device issues. Um, there's uh, really? little to no knowledge. We have 16 members of Congress who are physicians, uh, three in the Senate, 13 in the House. I think several urologists, a few GPs. We've got a, an ortho, we've got an ophthalmologist. We only have one pediatrician. Um, and she's brand new uh, from Washington State, just got elected last year, and she's on the Agriculture Committee. 
Um, and so we have very few members who actually, um, from their background, and, and our founding fathers intended, right, for, I'm gonna, I'm gonna geek out on you a little bit and get you excited about your government and how great democracy is, <laughs> but they intended that your, um, that your representatives be representative of the country, right? So we, we, um, we have folks from all walks of life and all backgrounds. Very few of them have a background that touches um, any kind of pediatric devices. And so that's when you start working on your committee staff, right? So your, your, um, your committees organize themselves around different topical areas. Um, the six committees that I mentioned earlier have each have staff. Um, most of those staff are, uh, not a single one of those committees has a staffer solely dedicated to pediatrics. Um, and so any of those staffers are also going to be wearing multiple hats. Um, you are lucky on your, um, I think on, on two of those committees, you might have um, a, a set of staffers who work specifically um, in an area of healthcare where they, they're going to have a good working knowledge. You do have um, one staffer on the Senate Finance Committee who is a pediatrician. And so, um, and her husband actually happens to work at Children's National, and, and, uh, and that helps us a little bit too. Um, but we have little to no knowledge um, on Capitol Hill about what pediatric devices are, um, or what the marketplace looks like, um, and educating around that market failure is a big thing that, um, that we have to do. And so, um, as government relations professionals, we understand how to pack um, the, the market failure around pediatrics into a 15 or 20 minute meeting, but, um, but that uh, requires us to be a funnel from all of you, where we're taking all the knowledge that you have and trying to distill it and boil it down into something that's actionable for um, staffers and members who have no background on, it, on this issue, don't understand the import around it, um, and need a very clear set of um, recommendations and guidelines for how they can be helpful. Absent that, you're probably going to have trouble. Yeah, and, and I would say when you think about policy making on Capitol Hill, you just look at the headlines. What's driving the news? So pediatric devices, I don't think so. Um, but, you know, opioid crises, the issues around high per prescription drug costs, those are things that Congress men and women and their staff are going to spend time trying to understand and, and learn more about because why? It's in the headlines, right? But what we need to be able to do is show how the work that we're doing ties into some of these issues. Um, you know, we heard today about a device that helps to identify when a baby has been exposed to opioid use. That's an important way for us to get in, to talk to a member of Congress who might care about this issue, not thinking about it from the pediatric perspective, but you know, relevant to what they're passionate about. And so we also have to be very creative about how we get in and get their attention on some of the issues that we want them to start thinking about. So do you, in your travels on Capitol Hill, do you um, see partisanship or bipartisanship? I mean, how does that play out in the peds realm? So yes, partisanship, yes, bipartisanship, right? So what you, uh, what you see in the headlines is the partisanship. What never makes it into the paper is the bipartisanship. You're not selling um, uh, any, he any newspapers and you're not making ratings on TV by talking about what a great job members of Congress are doing coming together around issues. Um, so uh, there are, as, as Tanya alluded to, there's, um, it's complex, there's layers, um, there's messages that you don't take into certain members and there's messages that you do take into other members. Um, we know that if we start talking about the spillover effect of pediatric devices, like Dr. Newman was talking about earlier, into the adult marketplace, and how um, some of those can save money um, for some of our entitlement programs, that's going to be a great message for Republicans. Um, we know that um, a, a message about market failures and, um, and, and Senate, or bringing in government funding 
to make up for those market failures and provide a public good to the most vulnerable of our citizens is going to be um, a good message for Democrats. Um, and I'm just I'm being very very general and boiling that down a lot. But um, but we can take the same platform and policy and and work our message just a little bit to make sure the right audience um, is willing to accept it, look into it, and research it on their own, which is what we're trying to get um, to in uh, every meeting that we take. Do you, any thoughts there in particular? Not, not anything to add. Partisanship, definitely. Um, and then just making sure that we don't let our issues get caught up in the, in the battle because when elephants fight, the grass loses. We don't want to lose. We want to be a part of the conversation. We don't want to get caught in the middle of um, you know, that partisanship. And I think because we represent the interest of children, uh, we have a really great story to tell there. And so oftentimes, I think we should use the advantage that we have representing the population of people we represent to advance our objectives um, in, in the policy making space. And, and Tanya makes a good point. Um, there are, are uh, a lot of members um, who are up for re-election in vulnerable seats and they're looking for something um, that is bipartisan to work on and that's when we bring a peds issue to them and you know that they love that right and that's the promise of a great campaign commercial um and and so you can really appeal to just some of their basic nature of wanting to get reelected on peds issues because those those do tend to help us um but um but otherwise we do have to navigate the um the pitfalls of not turning into fodder on a on a twitter feed or um True or being used as an object lesson in a gotcha hearing. So. Good point. Um, so are there, if we think about um, kind of policy issues in the PEED space, are there particular uh, policies or legislative concepts that we should be thinking about and starting to work on now uh, because it'll take a while um, to get to a consensus among a, a broad uh, variety of people. I mean, I'd be curious what you think the, those key items might be. Well, uh, let me start, because uh, I'll start broad. You know, I'll tell you that um, always when we're setting our policy agenda, there are some very basic things that will always be on the agenda. And it's all uh, primarily around payment. So protecting the Medicaid program, protecting the children's um, health insurance program, making sure that we are getting funding for children's graduate medical education. Um, those are kind of bread and butter issues for us. And uh, without that, we feel like we can't advance mission in any of the other sectors. And so that's got to be kind of a top priority. But then we also spend a lot of time working with Kalale and others uh, within our organization to understand where can we um, identify new opportunities for additional funding for pediatric uh, research issues. And we will spend a lot of time working with members of Congress, trying to find, you know, it might seem like small amounts of money, but to a program, it makes a, a significant difference. And so finding ways to leverage uh, potential funding opportunities for research activity is something that we spend a lot of time on um, at Children's National and in many of the other organizations that we're in. And if I might add, we do the same thing. I happen to be sitting at the table during lunch with a representative from um, one of the Maryland programs that helps to fund research initiatives in the state. And she was just giving me kind of the portfolio of the rich supports that Maryland provides 
for researchers and the work that they're trying to do. And so to learn from you that kind of activity, can we take that and make it happen in the District of Columbia, make it happen in Virginia? Maybe Susan and I were talking about taking it to one of the congressional leaders and saying, your state is doing something really fantastic. Why don't you push something similar at the federal level? And so having just table conversations can create ideas that help us to um, support the work that you're trying to do. And I would say um, kind of narrowing that scope down to pediatric devices, if we're talking about policy platforms around pediatric devices, Right? We're looking for ideas about incentives. How do we incentivize um, more companies uh, to create more, more devices? How do we de-risk that environment for those companies so they feel that they can put investment forward and have some assurance of a return on that investment? How do we make sure that the appropriate um, reimbursement is there um, for that device once it actually gets to market? Um, in the PEAS environment, that's really hard um, because it's so decentralized. Um, Tanya was just talking about uh, the, the state initiatives. All of the states have their own requirements for uh, state insurance and for uh, state Medicaid uh, versus the federal Medicare program, which covers seniors and, uh, of course, sets reimbursement rates for most of the adult population um, that, that insurers follow suit on. So uh, the, the reimbursement issues for PEDS devices are decentralized and create quite a challenge. Uh, there are tax issues. How do we ap provide appropriate tax incentives to get more product to market, to get more um, people interested um, in, those, in those products? And then there's regulatory infrastructure, right? So we've got a, a group of folks here from the FDA. Um, how do we make sure that they have um, enough enough bodies, how do, they, how do we make sure that our regulators are well-funded, are able to pursue the programs they know would be helpful to this community um, and, and this sector? Uh, and, and the converse of that is true, too, in a lot of places. How do we make sure that the regulators get out of our way to let innovation happen? Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those things are, um, are topics. Those are areas where a comprehensive pediatric device platform would touch on each one of those things. And a consensus platform um, is, it, there are ideas in all of those areas from different groups in the space, but there is no one consensus platform yet that's been developed on pediatric devices. So are there um, any uh, particular challenges? I think you touched on some of them, but uh, are there any particular challenges that you see in trying to, I guess, put together a package and then move that forward in a bipartisan way through Congress? Anything? Well, if I can piggyback on something Tanya just said. She talks about the platform for Children's National and all of the things that Children's is interested in. Um, J&J um, &J has a similar group of issues that they care about. Um, a very different group, but they'll have a similar lineup. Um, Avamed will do the same. AAP will have the same. Right. One of the challenges that we have in pediatric devices is that we're, uh, we're in the healthcare space, right, among a million different other policy topic areas. If you just, you know, scroll through your CNN newsfeed this morning and you're going to be worried about um, Ukrainian, uh, you know, support and uh, the election and what did or did not happen between Trump and the Ukraine and Joe Biden and members of Congress are worried about that. Um, you're going to see um, mass shootings happening and there's a whole bunch of gun violence um, work that's happening on the Hill. You're going to see um, topics about Iranian sanctions and, um, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, and so even just getting to health care is hard. Um, we, get, we get members interested in health care, and then we have to get them interested in pediatrics. And I already told you there's only one pediatrician in Congress. I can name off a half a dozen members that are interested in pediatrics. But getting then down to pediatric devices is even harder. And, um, and your organizations, all of your societies and large companies are necessarily going to reflect that hierarchy because they, um, 
they have to keep the doors open and the trains running and, they're, and the majority of their members' issues at the forefront. Um, and, and PEDS devices is not the number one thing for anyone. Um, and so we are a, a, a secondary, a tertiary, um, and, and I'm, this is Susan speaking. This is not Avamed, you know, J&J &J Children's or anything like that. But, but just being an observer of the space, one of the challenges that we always face in issues like ours that are, that are small in the grand scheme of things but so very significant mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that we have a whole lot of people interested but nobody interested in making it their number one. And so one of the things we want to do is, um, is to think about how we can create a coalition for all those who have this as their number two so that someone has it as their number one, right? So that's one of the things that we've been talking about. Um, how do we bring together all of those that are interested in this space but can't make it their number one issue and, um, but can support an effort that where that will be the only issue um, and, and build, um, and, and I think we've seen that at least um, in, in our observations in the government relations space be very helpful and impactful when you can bring together a coalition or an alliance um, to really take a tertiary issue and make it the number one issue and create